Rabbi, the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen. What a huge pleasure it is for me to be here this evening and bearing in mind the international prestige which the Oxford Union has. This is indeed both a pleasure and a privilege for me to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions which will follow my presentation. I've had a wonderful day in Oxford today, many engagements, many meetings. In particular, I had the pleasure of meeting the Jewish students here at the local JSOC, and uh, I want to pay tribute to UJS, which does such wonderful work for Jewish students here and right across the UK. Currently, we're in a fascinating and significant period in the Jewish calendar. Passover behind us, Pentecost, otherwise known as Shavuot, ahead of us. It's a seven-week period. And the festivals of Passover and Pentecost are linked together through the counting of the days that span the gap between the festivals, 49 days in all. Passover, of course, is the anniversary of our exodus from Egypt, which enabled us to attain our liberty from the shackles of Egyptian slavery. Seven weeks later, at the foot of Mount Sinai, the Israelite nation stood to receive the Torah, the five books of Moses. While Passover is all about freedom, Pentecost is about the responsibility which we need to attach to the freedom we enjoy. Because it was on Pentecost that God gave us a mandate through our Torah to live a meaningful life, a life which would be filled with moral values, an ethical way of life, a life through which the Jewish people could be a light unto the nations. So therefore, from this time of the year, we learn that freedom of opportunity needs to be translated into responsible living. Freedom of speech needs to lead to responsible talking. And freedom of religion needs to produce responsible faiths. And it is in this context that this evening, briefly, I would like to present to you my vision for Judaism in the 21st century. And we will look at Judaism through the prism of responsibility. All in all, I would like to devote time to five different elements of our responsibility as Jews and how it impacts on the world around us. We have a responsibility to God, a responsibility to ourselves and our families, a responsibility to community, a responsibility to Israel, and a responsibility to all of humanity. So first of all, our responsibility to God. And I start off with our responsibility to God because that is the very essence of our faith and all else flows from there. In the Talmud, that great massive volume of Jewish thought and law compiled during the years 200 to 500 of the Common Era, the question is asked, what's the most important verse of the Torah, the five books of Moses? And the first answer given by Ben Zoma is, that verse in Deuteronomy, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the essence of our monotheistic faith. We believe in one God. And notice that in this verse, the deity is described as both Lord and God. Lord means my personal God, the one who's interested in me as an individual, it's the one with whom I have a personal connection, a relationship, the God who cares about me, my past, my present, and my future. God describes the creator of the universe, the all-powerful, omnipotent God of all of mankind, fused into one being, and therefore I have the privilege, through my relationship with God, to have that personal connection with the creator who's interested in me and my life. I set the Lord before me always, says the psalmist, and that's the essence of my ongoing relationship with the Almighty. God, through his Torah, provides a mandate to me and my people, 
and a prescription for meaningful and joyous existence. And broadly speaking, there are two types of imperatives. There are those which are called the mishpatim, rational laws which we ourselves could easily have composed and created in order to have a viable and successful society. And then there are the chukim, laws which come from the Almighty. None of us could ever have dreamt of introducing such laws, such as can't have mixtures of meat and milk, can't have mixtures of linen and wool in our clothing. We sit under foliage for seven days in the year, eat the matzah bread for seven days in the year. A whole range of commandments no human being could ever have fathomed, but they come from God. They're part of his prescription for meaningful existence. I follow these laws, and through immersing myself in that way of life, I attain a life of huge meaning and wonderful joy for me and my family and for my community. Now, within that relationship that I have with God, I'm accountable to him. I have my freedom, but I must be responsible to my creator. And also I recognize that this is not the only existence. While physically we only have one life on earth, the soul continues to live on forever. God notices my personal sorrow and the sorrow of my people. And in what we call the world to come, everything will be balanced out, as a result of which the wicked who prosper will suffer in future times, and the righteous who suffer will benefit and will be rewarded. And all of this can be encapsulated in a beautiful story which is related in Kabbalistic literature, Jewish mysticism, and I'm going to modernize it for our purposes this evening. So the story is told of a man who lived a full life. He went up to heaven, and when he arrived there, he was alone. His soul was up there. There was a pathway, a road, and then there was a signpost, and the arrow was in the direction of heavenly court. And he thought to himself, yeah, well, I've lived a life on earth. I'm accountable to God. I now have to appear before the heavenly judge at my trial. He started to walk towards the court. And then he could hear a sound behind him. He looked round. There was a truck coming towards him. He hailed it down. Truck driver rolled down the window. He said, where are you going to? Truck driver said, I'm going to your trial. He said, oh. He said, and what are all those bags in your truck? He said, ah, those are the bags of all of your sins. He said, oh, I see. And he said, could you give me a lift? Truck driver said, I'm sorry, it's impossible. All these bags, you can see even here on the passenger seat, it's filled up with bags, I'm sorry. And off he drove and this poor guy thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? Carried on walking. He hears another sound from behind him. He looks around, it's a car. Stops the car. Says to the driver, where are you going? The driver says, I'm going to your trial. He says, oh, and what are those bags? He says, ah, those are the bags of all of your good deeds. He says, ah, right. Could I have a lift, please? Sure, says the driver. Come inside, take a seat, lots of space. <laughs> he's now in the car and he's thinking, oh my gosh, I've blown it big time. He sees ahead of him a huge building. There's a car park. The truck driver's already taking out all of his bags. He comes inside this enormous building. There he sees Almighty God presiding over the court. And in the middle of this large hall, there's a huge pair of weighing scales. And then he sees the truck driver putting bag after bag after bag on the one side, which is way to down on the one side. Eventually, he puts his very last bag. Then God motions to the car driver and he says, okay, your turn. He comes in with his few bags. He needs a stepladder to climb up to put the few bags up on the pan up at the top. He puts the last bag. God says, is that it? And suddenly there's a sound from outside. The man runs outside. Another truck has arrived. He runs up to the truck driver. He says, what have you got in your truck? The truck driver says, I've got bags of all of your sorrow. He said, wow. He comes running back in. The truck driver is told by God, take those bags of sorrow and put them on the side of the good deeds. Bag after bag after bag, starting to become leveled out. And another bag and another bag, 
Wow, it's coming close and close. A few more bags to go, ever so close. One more bag, the truck driver puts it on, and it's an absolute try. It's even, 50-50. And this man cries out to God and he says, God, why didn't you give me more sorrow? (laughs) (laughs) I get a lot of encouragement from that story in our tradition. It teaches us we're accountable to God. We have to be responsible in our lives. We have freedom, but it's here to be used for the benefit of our society. God notices what happens. We continue to exist in the world to come, and he's with us in our sorrow and in the world to come. Due to the responsibility we have, everything becomes evened out. The second area of our responsibility is to ourselves and our families. You see, there's a second answer to that question in the Talmud. What is the most important verse? And this answer is that verse in Leviticus, which we're all familiar with, love your neighbor as yourself. And notice that the love that is expected of us towards our neighbor is compared to the love we're expected to have for ourselves. We shouldn't deny our rights, our interests, our comforts, our benefits, our health, our spirituality. It's important that we should love ourselves. And so, as a result, we believe that the prime area within which we operate is within the small circle of our family life. What is the definition of a great person in our tradition? You can have some famous people who are great, but primarily the greatest people of all are genuinely considerate people who behind the scenes give of themselves to others. The Talmud tells us there's a concept of the 36 pious people through whose merit the world is sustained. People who behind the scenes are carers for those who need their attention and help within a family circle or within society. People who are volunteers. People who endure suffering and tragedy and who provide support and encouragement to others. Who against the reign of life are able to keep their heads above water, and to be a resource of incredible inspiration. They are our heroes. They are our great people. People who within their own family circle look after those who are close to them. And for us, family is crucially important. Relationships within the family are important. And it's interesting that one of the Laws of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments is to honor parents. Notice that it's to honor parents and not to love parents. Because our Torah only commands us to do something over which we have power. There's no love button. We can't force ourselves to love a person or a phenomenon. It's either there or not there. But to respect parents, to have hopefully the best possible relationship with them, regardless of circumstance, that's something which we should strive to achieve. But sometimes it is challenging. Sometimes our parents have strong views. Sometimes they interfere in our lives. You know, there's that, quest, that uh, story which relates to Friday night dinners. That's our Sabbath dinners, very central within the Jewish family, when the family comes together. So a man is complaining to his friend. He says, you know, I've got a problem. Every time I start dating a girl, and it's going really seriously, and I bring her home for Friday night dinner, my mother gets to know the girl, and then it's all over. So the friend says... I've got a suggestion for you. He says, what's the suggestion? The friend says, why don't you find a girlfriend who's just like your mother? (laughs) And you'll see, things should be okay. He said, well, not a bad idea. About a half a year goes by, and he starts dating a girl. She looks like his mother. She talks like his mother. Similar views to his mother. It's going really well. They're ready for the Friday night visit to the family circle. After the weekend, he bumps into his friend. Friend says, so how did it go? He says, it's all off. He says, what do you mean it's all off? Didn't your mother like her? He says, my mother loved her. So the friend says, so what was the problem? So he replied, my father didn't like her. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem with relationships. Life is complex. It's so challenging. But that's why we have laws relating to the family, to strive to keep the family together. And when it comes to our own existence and our family existence, it's important that we should refine our own ways. 
we have a concept called tshuva. Often it's translated as being penitence or repentance, but that's not the real translation. Tshuva means return, when we return to become our true selves. The best way I can explain it is from the world of art. Let's take a, a great sculpture, Michelangelo's David. There are two ways of explaining Michelangelo's greatness. One way is to say that Michelangelo created David out of nothing. <laughs> what a brilliant sculpt. The other way of explaining it is that actually David was always inside that slab of stone. Michelangelo's greatness was he knew what to remove in order to reveal David who was always there. And that is our concept of tshuva. We need to continuously engage in a process through which we peel away the unnecessary parts of our personalities and characters so that I can reveal the real me. So often I define my existence through striving to become the person I think others would like me to be. In our tradition, it's important that I should become the person God wants me to be, the person I'm supposed to be. What is that really? Well, I need to work it out for myself, who the true me is, and to enjoy being that person. And as a result, through concentrating on myself, I can make a major impact on society. There's that wonderful message which was written round about the year 1100 by an unknown monk who said, at the beginning of my life I tried to change the world and after many years of trying I didn't succeed so then I decided to change my nation and then after many years I didn't succeed at that and then I tried to change my town and didn't succeed at that. Then I tried to change my family, I had no luck and by the time now that I'm an old man I've decided to change myself and that's going really well. And so I've realized that I've wasted my life. I really should have started out life trying to change myself. And had I changed myself, that would have made a direct impact on my family. And my family, in turn, would have made that positive impact on my town and my town upon my nation and my nation upon the world. And that's what our religion preaches. We can change the world if we change ourselves, if we are responsible towards our real selves. <coughs> Our third area of responsibility is community. And right at the heart of the Jewish community is the synagogue. It has three names. Synagogue means house of gathering. Then there is house of prayer. And then there is shul. You've probably heard that word, which is from the German school. Because the synagogue for us is a place where we pray. It's a place where we teach and learn. And it's also a place where we gather. It's the focal point of an active community. And in the Bible, there are two key terms for a community. One is Eida, the other Kehillah. In Eida is a group of people who happen to be in one place at one time for one purpose, such as the audience at a theater or people watching a sports fixture. A Kehillah is a group of like-minded people who come together for the thrilling experience of doing what they love doing together. They've come together many times before. They'll be together on many occasions in the future. And as a result, they can empower each other through being part of that community dynamic. And in the book of Leviticus, we're told about blessings that will come our way in the event that we follow the laws of God. And one of them is, in a situation of battle, five of your soldiers will be able to successfully pursue 100 of the enemy, 100 of your soldiers will be able to successfully pursue 10,000 of the enemy. Notice, five to 100. 100 to 10,000. In the first instance, it's one to the power of 20, the other one to the power of 100. The greater the group, the larger the communal entity, the more power each individual has. And that's what we see, that the sum of all the total parts is so great when a community engages in a thriving and dynamic way. It brings the best out of every single individual. And the key element of community life is giving. Giving is central to our Jewish existence. In the Bible, we're given a law to contribute to the upkeep of the sanctuary and later the temple. Every member of the Jewish society needs to give a half shekel piece. They were given as charity and these coins were also counted. And as a result, we had a census figure every year. The result is, if you give, you're count you are counted. If you don't give, you don't count. And so it is in life. 
We are only of value if we give to our surroundings, to our environment. If we live only to take, then our lives are a waste of time. We are responsible to our community, to those around us. And we, in turn, will benefit immeasurably through the contribution that we give. Our fourth responsibility is towards Israel. The very first imperative given to Abraham and Sarah at the dawn of Jewish life was what we call Lech Lecha, for them to uproot themselves from their lives in Mesopotamia <coughs> and to engage on a journey which God described as to the land that I will show you. That became the land of Canaan, which in turn became the land of Israel. And from that earliest possible stage, Jewish life has been rooted in Israel, centered in Israel, inextricably bound up with what happens in Israel. Israel has been an integral part of our faith. And after Abraham, for the first time, bought some real estate in the Holy Land, it was under sad circumstances when his wife Sarah died, immediately afterwards, the Bible tells us that God blessed Abraham and he had everything. And our sages through the ages want to know how can any person ever have everything? And some reply by saying, once he had a foothold in the land of Israel, that meant everything to him. And ever since that time, Israel has meant everything to the Jewish people. For close to 2,000 years, being in <coughs> exile, distanced from our land, we have prayed three times a day for God to enable us to return to our land, and thankfully that was achieved. Further to the Balfour Declaration on the 2nd of November 1917, the decision of the United Nations on the 29th of November 1947, and the creation of the modern-day State of Israel on the 5th of May, sorry, the 15th of May in 1948. Now, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Another name for Jerusalem is Zion. And Jerusalem has always been a symbol of the Jewish state. But one might wonder, what qualities does Jerusalem have to become a capital city? In fact, it has none of the qualities that are necessary. First of all, a capital city needs to be accessible. If you look historically at Jerusalem, it's up in the mountains. The ancient way of the sea went from Egypt up to Lebanon. The King's Highway went from what today is Saudi Arabia up to Damascus. You would only reach Jerusalem if you were lost out in the hills and the mountains. It was far from any settled community. Furthermore, a capital city would usually be by the sea, or at the very least, on the banks of a river, for navigational purposes, and more importantly, so that there would be a constant source of water for the citizens. But there is no river in Jerusalem, and it's far from the coastline. And throughout our history, the citizens of Jerusalem have struggled to have a daily supply of water. So how did it happen that Jerusalem became the capital? The answer is in the book of Psalms where the verse tells us, the Lord has chosen Zion as a place for his habitation. Jerusalem has spiritual qualities. And indeed, that's something which is palpable when you go there. It's something that's in there. It's something that you feel. It's the holiness of the capital city of Israel. Jerusalem is Zion. And therefore, the Zionistic bond between Jerusalem and the state of Israel and the Jewish people it's something which represents our spirituality, our religion, our connection with God, our past, and also our future. The modern-day Zionistic movement, which was created in the latter part of the 19th century, was a response to the need for the Jewish people to have a state of their own at a time of increasing anti-Semitism in Europe. Zionism today is best defined as the, as the right of the Jewish people, like all peoples, for self-determination in her own homeland with insecure borders. Therefore, the whole notion of anti-Zionism, if one accepts this definition, which is the definition that 
most people hold, that whole notion of anti-Zionism amounts to an attack on the Jewish people. And it is lamentable that we find today an increase in anti-Zionism in various places in the world. It is lamentable that we find people calling out, you're a Zion. Sometimes it's with reference to Jews, sometimes to those who are not Jews. Zionism is a reflection on Judaism. Zio is a reflection on Jews. Just substitute Zionism for Judaism and Zio for Jew. And it is lamentable as well that we're seeing in Europe and here in the UK as well an increase in anti-Semitic sentiment and activity. And one is saddened to read the essence of the report of Baroness Ryle concerning the Oxford University Labour Club and events that have happened here on this campus. And I'm sure you join with me in recognising that there can only be zero tolerance towards all anti-Semitism here in Oxford, on all campuses in this country, and indeed within our society at large. The Jewish people have a very special bond with Israel, with the state of Israel. And please understand, I'm not suggesting for one moment that every single person should always support every action and policy of a particular government of Israel. Not at all. In fact, all you have to do is to visit Israel, and there you'll find some of the fiercest critics of any government of Israel, because Israel is a very robust and vibrant democracy. But what I am saying is that sometimes anti-Zionism crosses the line as a result of which it is actually anti-Semitism. And this is something which we certainly should not tolerate within our society today. The Jewish people have a responsibility to the land and through the land to our God. This is an integral part of our Judaism. My fifth category relating to responsibility is our responsibility towards all of humanity. I mentioned that Talmudic question of what is the most significant verse? And the next answer comes from the sage Ben Azai of the second century. And he said the most important verse of the whole Torah is Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, which reads, This is the book of the generations of man on the day on which God created man in the image of God, he formed him. And Ben Azai's point is every human being is created in the image of God, and therefore we have a responsibility towards all of mankind. As a result, the Jewish concept of the messianic era is not one within which everybody needs to be Jewish to enjoy that great time of redemption. No, on that day the Lord will be one, his name will be one, and all good people will benefit from the time of redemption. God is the God of all of mankind, and we embrace all of mankind, and we need to recognize the special nature and unique nature of every single human being. It is for this reason that we have a wonderful concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, Jewish social responsibility, through which we are charged within our faith to look beyond the confines of our faith, to care for all of society. It is this concept which has empowered me as chief rabbi to try to lead from the front. So for example, with the refugee crisis, I asked our Jewish community in the UK to give generously towards funds to help refugees who are in danger, whose lives are on the line. And then in August of last year, I visited Edomeni on the border between Greece and Macedonia to witness at first hand how the funds that we have raised here in the UK are being used genuinely and literally to save lives of refugees there. And I drew such a lot of comfort and gratification and inspiration from what we are achieving there. In a similar spirit, when my wife and I were on an official trip to India in December, January, in addition to visiting 19 Jewish communities in five cities in India, we also visited slums there, in Calcutta and in Mumbai. And there we witnessed at first hand what Jewish organizations within Israel and around the world are doing to help those who are suffering from dire poverty in the slums. 
And let me share with you just one example. It's the Gabriel Project, Mumbai. Terrorists attacked the Taj Royal Hotel in Mumbai. And as has been the case in Paris and Copenhagen and other places, in addition to a general terrorist attack, there followed immediately an attack on a Jewish target. And in Mumbai, and this was eight years ago, the attack was on the Chabad Center. And there, the Rabbi Gabriel and his wife and a few others were shot dead. And a man by the name of Jacob Stockman, an Australian Jew who now lives in Israel, was on a visit to India and he wanted to visit the slums. This was five years ago. And when he saw what I saw when visiting the slums, such appalling poverty, surely millions of people should not be allowed to suffer in this way. He said, we as Jews have a responsibility to do something. And so he established the Gabriel Project Mumbai, named after Rabbi Gabriel. And the first thing he did was to establish some learning centers, some schools for those who weren't learning, because I strongly believe in read and feed. We need to teach people how to be literate, and as a result, they can empower their families to earn a living and to fill their stomachs. And one of the brightest kids was a 14-year-old boy whose name was Shravan, a wonderful kid. It was absolutely obvious. He was top of the class. He would be break free from the slums. He would enter into regular society. But one day, Shravan was coughing in class. The next day, his brother came to tell the teacher, Shravan's not coming to school today because he's sick at home. And the day after, the boy came and said to the teacher, last night, Shravan died. And the teacher went to inquire from the family what happened. Shravan developed the flu. And the teacher said, well, why didn't you take him to a doctor? And they said, what doctor? There's no medical facility here. We would have to have enough money to get on a train to travel to the closest medical facility. This was reported to Jacob Stockman in Israel. He specially came over to Mumbai, to those slums, and he established the Shravan Medical Center. And I had the privilege on my visit to those slums to affix a mezuzah. It's a parchment scroll which we place on the entrance to Jewish homes and facilities with the blessing, and I affix the mezuzah at the entrance to the Shravan Medical Center, a most remarkable facility established through the generous contributions of Jewish people and Jewish organizations around the world. It serves the needs of 200,000 people who otherwise would have no medical facility. And this, for me, is a fine example of what Judaism is about. We have a responsibility through our Judaism to all of humanity, to reach out to all of mankind. So as a result, it is up to us to show that we're not only interested internally for ourselves, but we're here for all of society. And the final teaching I'll share with you relates to a law of kashrut, of kosher food. You know, when it comes to animals, which are kosher, which are not, we're given signs. Fish, we're given signs. But when it comes to birds, how do we know if we as Jews can eat them or not? In the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, there's a list of all the birds which are impure. We call them treif. You can't eat them. One of the birds on that list is the stork. The Hebrew name for stork is chasida. Chasida means the pious one, the righteous one. What an incredible name for a creature to have. But it's on the list of the birds which we cannot eat. And we have a tradition that those birds on that list are birds of prey. And that's why we don't bring them internally into our bodies. So how is it possible that the stork has a remarkable name of being the pious one, but it's on the list of cruel birds which we cannot eat. And the answer, according to our tradition, is that the stork is kind, but only to birds of its own feather. Towards its own kind, within its own inner circle, it shows piety. Towards other birds and other creatures, it acts with disdain. Therefore, it might be pious, but its way of life is unacceptable. And so too with us ourselves. To be engaged only within one's own circle, and this applies 
throughout all of society, to have one's own clique, to only be bothered about people within one's own, one's own circle, one's own faith group. One might be pious, one might be filled with a huge amount of consideration and loving kindness. Yes, that's piety, but it is unacceptable. What is acceptable in our tradition is to be there absolutely for one and all. So therefore, I take an enormous amount of pride in what our Judaism is for us. It's a template for meaningful and joyous life. And from it, so many other people can learn lessons for their lives. We need to show within our tradition responsibility to God, responsibility to ourselves and our families, responsibility to community, responsibility to Israel, and responsibility towards all of humanity. Easy to say, we're trying our best, hopefully we will succeed, and hopefully in turn, together with many others, by working on ourselves, eventually we will change the world. Thank you very much. Chief Rabbi, thank you so much for sharing your vision with us and thank you also for the relationship advice. I, <laughs> I'm going to start off with a couple of questions myself sure. before opening up to the audience. And I want to pick up on a couple of things that you spoke about in your talk and your fourth responsibility that you spoke about was about Israel and you explained how Jewish life has always been and is inextric inextricably bound up with Israel. Given that, do you find yourself able to separate the religious nature of your role with the political nature of the State of Israel? I think that's a good question. Um, yes, I'm a faith leader. I'm not the ambassador of the State of Israel. At the same time, because Israel is so central to our Jewish religion, to our faith, then I find that there is a very strong connection. Uh, and as a result, I found it appropriate to speak about Israel tonight within the context of our faith, not as a political representative. So do you think that you should have, do you think you should have any influence over the political nature of the state of Israel or would you like to keep your role entirely religious as it were? Well again, there are parts of our religion which are politically connected. We cannot separate them totally. And therefore, I do find myself occasionally, usually in private, expressing my views to leaders whom I believe should hear my views, uh, because it's important that my voice should be heard and that uh, the voices of Jewish people around the world should be heard with regard to matters in Israel. Sure. And from the reverse perspective, do you think that Israel should consider the impact of its policies on diaspora Jews around the world? Or do you think that Israel's duty is just to its own people? We find that traditionally uh, leaders of the government of Israel are concerned about world Jewry. Usually there is a ministry of diaspora affairs. Uh, there are indeed strong connections uh, and it's a real connection. Um, Israel in the first instance as a sovereign state has the prime responsibility to protect her citizens and to do what is necessary. And I think that's totally understandable. And at the same time, we do find that the connections are strong. Thank you. Um, you're well known for supporting the expansion of women's roles within Orthodox Judaism. Um, in 2012, you appointed Lauren Levin as Britain's first Orthodox female halachic, halachic advisor. And do you think that we will ever see a female Orthodox rabbi? Well, I'm very pleased that beyond that appointment, because since then I became chief rabbi, having seen the success of that initiative. Only a few months ago, together with the London Beit Din, I launched an initiative which goes further than the Yoetzet Halakha, and we're calling the title Mayan. Uh, and we're currently interviewing uh, for those who've applied to join our course, and uh, our expectation is that by April of 2017, we will have a large group of graduates from our Mayan program. And the result is that within our Orthodox communities, you'll have senior rabbi, assistant rabbi, Mayan, youth director. 
there will be a woman who will be in a prominent position to be an educational resource and guide and mentor within our communities. Um, so that is the next step, which I'm delighted that we are innovating. It is very important for us to allow all people within our communities, and that of course includes women, to know that they are fully included, fully appreciated, and there is a meaningful role. And we as communities are all the poorer if we don't utilise the incredible talent that women have to provide to us. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about the danger of rising anti-Semitism in Britain and this common excuse or explanation that there's a distinction between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in, in some form. What do you make of the recent election of the new NUS president, Malia Bouattia? I think it's highly lamentable. I think it's a reflection not only on her views, but also on the views of those who elected her to that role, even though I'm pretty sure they were aware of her views. Um, and uh, I understand now that on 24 campuses around the country, there are considerations relating to possible disaffiliation. Uh, I know that feelings are running very high uh, on many campuses. And certainly, it is a development which I think is highly regrettable. Thank you. Uh, one final question from me for the moment. You are a huge supporter of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wanted to know, do you think there are uh, similarities, given their tribal nature, between football and religion? <laughs> and if you had to give up one of them, which would it be? <laughs> I hope that I'll never face that dilemma of having to give up one of them. <laughs> uh, it's so healthy for us to have an interest in sport. Sport is so crucially important for us. Yes, I'm a Spurs supporter. And uh, I'll, I'll give you one analogy, actually. You know, <coughs> often in a state of weakness, we define ourselves not only according to what we are, but also what we're against. We find this happening in many circles. I think that whatever group we're part of, we should have the self-confidence to go out and play for ourselves and show our best side without having to push others down. So, you know, the Spurs, Arsenal or City United kind of tensions. I think it's a pity when, uh, in addition to supporting your team, you have to be against another team. And so too, I find an expression of that, for example, in our Jewish community. Uh, historically in the UK, there have been some high moments of tension between the Orthodox community and some non-Orthodox communities. And when becoming Chief Rabbi, I made it clear that I would never publicly criticise non-Orthodox Jewish communities. The analogy I give is actually from the world of cricket, not from football. I believe we should be batsmen and not bowlers. We should be showing how great we are in terms of our tradition, what we have to offer, we need to pile on the runs. Our aim should not be to try to bowl other people out. Let's give others the space that they wish to do what they wish to do, and let's show that what we have is of genuine quality. And I think that the same applies to football, different teams, and within society in general. Thank you. <coughs> We're going to open up now to questions from the audience. And can we start, please, with the... Uh the question about halfway back on my right-hand side, the member in the cream jumper. Thank you. It's a very good talk you gave. Uh, some Jewish faith leaders in recent years have said that Europe is no longer safe for Jews and that they should um, think about going and returning, if you like, to Israel. Do you think this is an appropriate response to the series of anti-Semitic attacks we've seen? I have a strong view on that. Um, my view is the same view as the President of Israel, Reuben Rivlin. I had an opportunity to have a conversation with him, and this is one of the issues that I raised last year when I met with him in the President's House in Jerusalem. Um, for people to go and live in Israel, I think it's wonderful that Jews have that opportunity in our time, uh, and it should be for the right reasons, for idealistic reasons, um, not because we might be running away from somewhere else. And um, clearly, here in Europe, there is a rise in anti-Semitism. We do need to be concerned about it, but it hasn't reached the alarming levels further to which 
one would issue a call for Jews to be on the run, far from it. And definitely within the UK, we as a Jewish community are truly blessed. Yes, there is anti-Semitism and an increase in it, but that's the exception to the rule. The rule is we're blessed to be within a marvellous society, to have full freedom of opportunity and to enjoy being British. So that is my strong view on the subject. Thank you. We'll go to the question from the gentleman in the blue shirt on the back row. I, I won't say I, I'm, I'm, I was brought up in the Catholic tradition, but um, I happen to be gay. So I, I was interested you were saying about including women. I just wanted to know, obviously in the Christian world there's a debate about the inclusion of gays and lesbians in the church, and I wanted to know um, is there a similar debate in Judaism? And what the, obviously I know that the liberal, uh, the reform, liberal Jews support gay marriage, but I'm not sure about how the debate is in, in Judaism. I'd Thank like you for the question. It. it goes without saying that homophobia is totally unacceptable, and we within our Jewish communities need to be fully inclusive. Uh, it is a message that I give often to our rabbis. Um, the view of our Torah with, rego with regard to homosexual intercourse is well known, and we do not have a concept of gay marriage. But equally so, the view of our Torah is well known when it tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to not judge people according to their gender, their ethnicity, or their sexuality. And it's very important within our communities that every single Jewish person, every person should know that they are absolutely welcome in our midst and they should have full opportunity within our communities. Thank you. And we'll go to the question just next to you. Thank you. Actually, building on that, um, uh, I'm really interested in the idea of intermarriage, right? In the 21st century, people get intermarried all the time, Jews marrying non-Jews. It, it, it's a reality. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this, and uh, if you could explain the view of the community on this. So, don't forget, in, in my entire presentation, I'm representing orthodoxy uh, within Judaism. Um, and also, just by the way, in case you're, you're not familiar with the hierarchical uh, situation within the Jewish world, we don't have an equivalent of a pope. You might presume you know, might hear some statements issued by a chief rabbi of Israel. He's the chief rabbi of Israel and nowhere else. And um, rabbis as well are on an equal footing uh, with all people. We have an equally uh, opportunistic gateway to God, and no person is above any other person. I'm just saying that uh, by the way, so that you can understand <coughs> our system. And um, with regard to uh, the question? <laughs> I would you mind just summarizing your question yeah. again? Intermarriage? Was intermarriage. Was so with regard to intermarriage, we do indeed have strong views. Um, because it's important for us to marry within the faith. In that way, bearing in mind the strength and centrality and importance of the Jewish family circle, in that way, we will add strength to our Judaism and preserve our Jewish identity. Through intermarriage, our Jewish identity will become diluted. So that is why we are strong proponents of marriage within the faith. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the question from the member near the fireplace on my left-hand side. Thank you very much. Um, my question is on your work with interfaith relationships and the importance that this plays in the UK and Israel and worldwide. Thank you. Interfaith is of exceptional importance to us. I prioritise it as a faith leader. I'm pleased to inform you that we have excellent relationships between faith leaders in this country, and that includes all faiths. Um, for me, a matter of concern is the importance of enabling such cooperation and warmth of relationship to filter down to the lowest level. When I had a meeting, an audience with Pope Francis in September in the Vatican, this is one of the issues that I raised with him, and we agreed that the achievements of Nostra Aetate, which we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of last year, 
through which the Catholic Church changed its direction. Um, and we, the Jewish people, welcomed it immensely. What we therefore find is that within that pyramid of engagement, right at the top, things have changed. There is warmth of relationship. But within Catholic communities worldwide, those changes haven't adequately filtered down to the lowest grassroots levels. And I think that's the most challenging area to enable people within all faith communities, in their synagogues and mosques and churches and temples, to actually know what their faiths truly represent and for them to establish a meaningful relationship with people of other faiths. And I very strongly advocate social interaction, more understanding, an increasing level of dialogue between ourselves and others. And this is something that all of us can do. Even if you're an atheist, at least you can get people together and engage in dialogue. It is of enormous importance, particularly as today, so much bloodshed is taking place in the name of religion. So therefore, within our religious worlds, we need to have greater levels of understanding. Thank you. We'll go to the question on the front row. Hello. Um, my question goes into a direction that you somehow implicitly mentioned in your talk. You were talking about both scriptural contexts and modern realities. My question is, as a theologian, I struggle to bring a scriptural context together in, in, in the Bible itself. And in, in, in many ways, um, I believe that some commandments and ideas of the Jewish Tanakh have, have lost their relevance for today. How do you transfer or translate scriptural tradition to modern realities. Thank you, that's a great issue. Yes, there are some commandments and some contexts which are purely historically uh, related. And that's how we can understand uh, some statements in the Bible which seem totally alien to us within our modern times. Together with that, the bulk of biblical law is of high relevance to us. And let me give you an example, the Sabbath. So I introduced what we call Shabbat UK, which now has taken place twice. Uh, it's one Sabbath in the year through which I call on all Jews throughout the UK to try to keep some of the Sabbath, to engage with the community, to transform a Saturday into a Sabbath. And it has worked amazingly well. But one dimension of the success of Shabbat UK is one that I didn't predict. And that is the impact it's had on wider society. So before our very first Shabbat UK, which was two Octobers ago, there was an editorial in the Times on the Saturday before calling on all Jews to keep the Sabbath on Shabbat UK and also calling on all other citizens of the UK to identify one day in seven through which they would have what I was calling at the time a digital detox day, through which we could uh, distance ourselves from the digital world which is starting to rule our lives as opposed to the other way around. And therefore you find in the Sabbath a concept of enormous relevance. I would say that our Sabbath is more relevant in our 21st century than it has ever been in the history of the world. So we're blessed to have this timeless, continually relevant guide to life, which is our Torah. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. <coughs> we'll go to the gentleman on the front row on my left-hand side. Thank you. Um, thank you for your inspirational speech, first of all. I have a slightly abstract question. Um, during your speech, you talked about your relationship with God. Um, so I'm interested, what form does God take for you? How would you define God? I feel God. I experience Him. And by the way, don't have, we shouldn't have hang-ups about the him and not the her. Because in Hebrew, some of the names of God are in the masculine, some like Shekhinah are in the feminine. So it could be him, it could be her, it's actually neither, because God is the creator. And God is my unbelievable support when I'm going through crises, difficult times. I know that he's with me. Um, he supports me. It's something intensely personal. It's a deep awareness. I know he's with my family, I know he's with my people, I know he's with society. Um, and therefore, I don't personally need to prove in a cerebral fashion that God is there because I feel his existence and I'm very fortunate in that way. If you want a lecture on the proof of God, I'll be delighted to give it as well. Uh, <laughs> but that's how I experience God. Thank 
Thank you. Um, and finally, we'll go to the question towards the back of the hall on my right hand side. Um, hi, I just wanted to ask a question in regards to the NUS referendum. Um, just speaking as someone who like is Jewish and openly, outwardly practicing, and is proud to be Jewish, and like the recent developments within UN within the NUS do worry me and do concern me and do make me more scared and uncomfortable to be outwardly Jewish within Oxford and as a student and in the UK in general. But at and I do think that something needs to be done to like, highlight this to the NUS and to the rest of the UK. But at the same time, it's also an organisation that does a lot beneficially for other minority groups and for people with disabilities and mental illnesses and makes it possible for a lot of people to survive as students that otherwise wouldn't be able to. And part of me is thinking that um, standing up for anti-Semitism in such a way as to... Um, disaffiliate the entire university from the NUS is somewhat of a selfish act. Like I'm hesitant to use the word, but I just wondered what your views were on that. I leave it up to the Oxford Student Union to decide its future, whether it will or will not be affiliated to NUS. And that's what I'm saying to, to all student bodies on our campuses around the country. I was very saddened to hear what you said with regard to your personal experiences. That's exactly what Baroness Royal reported on, that in the Labour Club here at Oxford University, there is a culture which allows a situation through which Jewish students feel uncomfortable. And you were expressing that and about your general feeling on campus. It's a very sad day for our society for such a phenomenon to exist. And that's why I personally am outspoken about the need for an adequate response. And the adequate response on our campuses and throughout our society within political parties and in every other sphere is simply zero tolerance when it comes to anti-Semitism. And I'm pretty sure that there's something everyone here agrees with and all reasonable people agree with. Anti-Semitism is not just another form of racism. Uh, it is a threat not only to Jews, it's a threat to all of our society. And we as a society need to respond to it in the strongest possible way. So I do sincerely hope that matters for you personally and for others like you will improve. And uh, I sh understand your dilemma with regard to NUS. And that is something that I would not give any direct advice on. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. Please could you all remain in your seats and join me in thanking once again Chief Rabbi Mervis.